I'd like to welcome you to another one of the Sustainability Dialogue series in, uh, put on by Sustainable Claremont. Uh, we're approaching number 100. This is number 98. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we have a great speaker this evening, but uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our executive director, uh, Stuart Wood, who's around here somewhere. <laughs> there he is. Who will introduce the speaker this evening? And I usually wait a moment or two after seven o'clock because some people like Jennifer come in late. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we can probably get started now, so I'll just turn this over to Stuart. Great, thank you, Freeman. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I just wanted to, to take a quick minute to introduce uh, Char uh, Miller. Professor of Pomona College, and there's you know a long list of things we can we can talk about to introduce Char. So we'll go through some of some of them now. Um, so Char teaches courses on U.S. environmental history, water in the U.S., and public land management. Um, things like urbanization, interplay between the natural and built landscapes. Um, these are topics that have deeply influenced his writing, his teaching, his scholarship, and and sort of paved the way for how he approaches. Um, scholarship across the five C's and across uh, Pomona College's environmental analysis and history programs. Uh, in 2013, he was named Whig Distinguished Professor at Pomona College for Teaching and Excellence, and in 2015, received the Alumni Office's Distinguished Services Award. He's a senior fellow of the Pinchot Institute for Conservation and a fellow of the Forest History Society. Um, he has served as a consulting historian for more than a dozen documentaries and worked closely with museums in Los Angeles and San Antonio to develop exhibits and educational materials. Um, all these outreach uh, efforts have influenced his teaching and his scholarship. Uh, most recently, and maybe most importantly, uh, he's an active, one, an, excuse me, active and award-winning scholar with many publications, and most recently, um, The Nature of Hope, Environmental Justice, Grassroots Organizing and Political Change, uh, which will tie in very closely to the, the lecture that we're gonna hear tonight. Um, before, we, uh, before I hand it over to the charge, just one more announcement really quick. Uh, in about two weeks, we're gonna be showing a film series here for Sustainable Claremont. It's gonna be at the Rose Hills Theater, and it's gonna be focused on local food production and um, the interplay between sustainability and, and how we produce food. We're gonna have Uncommon Good there, we're gonna have a local food producer, uh, and we're still kind of figuring out the details, but if that sounds like something that's interested or interesting to you, please let me know or sign up to our newsletter and we'll, we'll get you those details as soon as possible. So without any further ado. Uh, uh, oh. Let me just say something. Okay. Uh, as part of this dialogue, we welcome questions from the audience but we're videotaping the program, so if you have a question to ask, please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you so we can get it recorded properly. Thank you. Okay, well that seems like that's my cue. Um, and so a couple of things. The, the, the talk tonight is actually derived from two books, one of which was The Nature of Hope um, as a kind of framework that I want to use uh, to describe this. But, it, but this photograph in particular, I want to start there because it comes from a book from 2016 um, that I did with photographer Tim Palmer. This is the first photograph that he took for the book because we met here. We sort of mapped out what he would do and what I would write. And he went off up into uh, the mountains and I would say that that's water vapor, but we know that's not the case. Um, but it, and because Tim lives in Oregon, and so he made sure that he had a little dig in there to Los Angeles. Um, but, but, you know, the, the Angeles National Forest and really the San Gabriel Mountains are our front yard or our backyard, depends on how commodious that space is for you. Um, it is the thing against which this entire space is created. It is actually the source of the soil that we stand on, has flowed off of here. The water that we drink, upwards of 60, 65 percent in Claremont on a good year, comes from underneath our feet. Um, they are the source of our life, um, visually, aesthetically, recreationally, and in every other way. Um, I had a young colleague who I was trying to get to Pomona uh, to convince her to come, and I was taking her to the Ontario airport, and she just kept looking at those mountains. She was from Philly. She didn't know from mountains. And she was just blown away 
by that structure, by the, the sort of verticalness of them, which we don't see around the world. These are some of the steepest mountains on the planet. Um, and so it makes for a dramatic dra backdrop, foreground, um, and it's partly why I love living here because of those dynamics. It's really been quite powerful. And that's important in a way to think about at least the last word in the subtitle, the Anthropocene, because those mountains, as important as they are, um, are under stress like every mountain chain everywhere, um, but, but we have particular stressors, and I'm gonna get to that in a bit. Um, but the most important piece of this, it seems to me, is that, that the Anthropocene, that is to say, that which is we are driving through climate change, the changes that we're producing, um, is really setting up uh, what for me is an existential crisis, framed around data that is necessarily incomplete and requires us to act knowing that we don't know enough in which to drive our actions. But we have to, there's no question about that. So that's a real bummer because I just wrote a book called The Nature of Hope and you're wondering what the hell is the connection between the downbeat and the upbeat. And the way of thinking about that, which is really what helped create this anthology called The Nature of Hope was to think about what it means, and I have some of my colleagues in this room, what it means to walk into a classroom with 18 and 19 year olds and say the world is over. <laughs> and good luck. And so the, those of us in the EA program at Pitzer and Pomona and elsewhere have been having the conversations about how we in fact reframe this conversation um, about climate change and the world that they are going to inherit, that they are walking into. Um, and part of the way to reframe it is not around optimism, but it is around hope. That hope is not the smiley-faced version, that's optimism. Hope is actually as, um, as a way of thinking about our life in the world, that when you get up in the morning, the thing that you aspire to is sort of your armor and you wear that and you move into the world in hopes that, in, in hopes that um, you can make the ideal world closer to that which is real. And that doesn't give you any um, sense that you will complete that journey, but it does force you out of the house and into the world uh, to begin that kind of dialogue and to begin that kind of concern. Um, we're not the only generation to feel this way. And so that's where I really want to start this talk because those mountains, posed dilemmas for those who lived here 140 years ago. They thought they were in an existential crisis also, and if you lived in the Rockies, they felt the same way. If you lived up in the Cascades and the Wasatch, they felt the same way. Um, and what came out of that are a series of social institutions, the Forest Service, the Park Service, what would ultimately become Bureau of Land Management. These are actually, their roots are, are located in what the late 19th century knew to be a fundamental crisis in the United States that had to be resolved knowing that they didn't know enough to do, know what the full resolution was. So what I want to do is to help you understand what they tried to work their way through, uh, one of the results of which is the Angeles National Forest, the third or fourth oldest national forest in the United States. Um, and so to do that, I went back and, and nicely prettified some, some maps uh, that the Forest Service produced in the 1920s, but which are framed around arguments from actually the 1870s that just got passed down from generation to generation, and finally the Forest Service said, this is a really great argument, let's make maps. So the first map, area of virgin forest in 1620. By the way, it's wrong, but that's what they thought that the deer-hearted pilgrims who hopped off of a boat somewhere in Massachusetts, let's call it Plymouth, were confronted with primeval forests that stretched from New England, let's call it Maine, all the way down to central Texas, and if you were a really industrious squirrel, you could have walked without ever touching the ground from one canopy to the next, or so the map would suggest. That's not the case. Native peoples had been cutting and burning and harvesting and using these resources such that those same pilgrims hopped off and went, God, this looks very park-like. I wonder why. Because someone had been managing it for multiple thousands of years, uh, those open spaces within these forests. But nonetheless, this is what they thought that the world looked like. And that thought is crucial because of what then happened. So let's go from 1620 to 1850. And what do you see? 
not that hard. Let's start with the obvious. We'll, we'll, we'll play with it in a second. A lot less virgin force. Great. So where is it getting cut? Over here, yes. Let's call this the East Coast. Fair enough, yes. Not so much where in the mountains. What's left? I mean, the West, okay, we, we already got that for a second. Hold on the West for a second. Okay, so why? Why not get the peaks of the Appalachians? It's tougher to log. It's tougher to log. But it's not just tougher to log. What are you doing with the logs? Getting them somewhere. So what's the easiest way to get logs in 1850, do keep in mind, rivers. So the other thing is to start at the coast and move inland and start to imagine all of those rivers coming out of Virginia, all of the rivers in North Carolina, and that's your passageway because rivers are cheap. You throw logs in there and it does all the work. Human beings are lazy, smart but lazy. It's going to use that energy to move those logs down. When do you do this work? Spring. Why spring? Because? This is all obvious. Give it to me. Snow melt. Just snow melt. You go in when the snow is on the ground if you're a logger. Why? You slide it. And then you lay it, lay it down by the Delaware River, say, for example, that runs the creates the interesting concave set of uh, parts of New Jersey. And then you wait until the snow melts, you roll it into the river, and you ride log rafts downstream to every river port to sell, whether it's New Jer in New Jersey or, or Pennsylvania. And that was your market. And then you walked back up, and you chopped again the next winter, and you did the same process. That's an awful lot of wood coming down very quickly. I mean, 130 years, okay, but it's still fast, given that they're swinging axes and that's all they have. The other thing to note is Ohio. It does have a big river, I will grant you that. Why so much wood out in 1850 in Ohio? There's not a lot of people there. So how'd they get it all out? This is a fun one. And you'll never guess. Pigs. Why? Settlers loved pigs. They liked to eat them, but first they used pigs to take out limp timber because they root. And they just dropped forests like crazy. And then you went and killed the pigs and you ate them. So the pig did all of the work for you and then they gave you protein. It's a brilliant system. So Cincinnati was called Porkopolis. And as best one can tell, and every novel that's ever been written about Ohio talks about the stench coming out of Cincinnati because you rendered pigs down for what? Lard. Lard, for soap. Procter & Gamble's headquarters are in Cincinnati. There is a direct connection between deforestation of Ohio and the soap that would be produced in that same river town to which those pigs were ultimately brought. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to think about what's possible when you don't have chainsaws and you don't really have railroads. But when you do have chainsaws, or rather, when you do have railroads, and you go from 1850 to 1920, aha. So really, it's not the first 130 years. It's the last 70 that are the point at which people went, oh my god, what the hell has happened? So how do we explain this? In 70 years, this kind of clear cutting from one end of the, of, of the continent to another, they're building, what are they building? Okay, good. What else? Railroads. And how do you put down railroad tracks? Railroad ties, 3,000 ties per mile, do the math. It's a lot of railroad ties and by the time you finished at one end you had to go back and replace them. So this is a constant churn. By 1890 the expectation was that they use something like a billion board feet of, of timber to put down rail ties for a several, like two to three transcontinental railroads. That's a lot of wood. 
but you also burned wood to drive the engines. To get the coal out, you had to mine down seven miles. How did you shore up those mines? Wood. Harbors had wharves. You had to do wood. There's a road called a cordor corduroy road where you actually took logs and put them through swamps, and that was your roadbed. So you're consuming wood all over the place all of the time. It was in a massive system that is framed around three things, urbanization, industrialization, and immigration. The big three drivers of mid to late 19th century US history help us understand this map. How about population? Well, that's what urbanization's about, <laughs> and immigration. I mean, we're pulling in a million new people every year in the last two decades of the 19th century. That's a lot of people. Immigration, urbanization, and industrialization. There will be a test. And she's going to get an A because she's <laughs> taking notes. This is great. So imagine yourself living in the period between 1850 and 1920 and seeing and knowing this is happening because it didn't happen for everyone at all times. But that generation, those really those two generations, for those who are watching what's happening, for those who are scientists, for those who are starting to call themselves conservationists, because that's a movement that's emerging at this exact same moment, are beginning to look at that map and go, this is an existential crisis. We have to do something to slow ourselves down. If the language sounds similar, it is. They are thinking about how to control themselves. And conservation was the language that they borrowed from Europe, transformed into American idiom, and begin to argue with themselves about what this entailed. Well, what it entailed is hard to know because what you really want to do first is to create a popular urgency, a sense that conservation is needed, as if we also need some kind of climate change dialogue that is needed. So you've got to come up with ways by which to convey this. So take the photograph. Take a camera. The photographs I'm going to show you for this and a couple of others are some of the first shots that the Forest Service took. Uh, after its creation in 1905, and actually many of these were taken before that point, because Gifford Pinchot, who would become its first chief, was convinced that the way, in fact, you, con you convinced other people that there are problems is not through words. He understood that the vocabulary of the United States in the late 19th century was all about image. So give them the image, and then explain to them what they're looking at. So this is a clear cut in Michigan, Enacted in 1860, this photograph is taken 50 years later. What didn't happen? No regrowth, right? So you took off the forest, it went into the economy, good. What was supposed to happen? Either it was supposed to regrow or farming. See any furrows? By the way, Michigan should never have been unzipped of its timber. Its soil sucks. They made a huge mistake um, in terms of, well, because the assumption was you took it out in Massachusetts and that worked, so why not in every state subsequent to that? And it doesn't work in some places, and Michigan is one of those places. The Forest Service takes that photograph and just uses it emblematically as a way to convey its concerns. Here's a photograph 10 years later of a clear cut in Colorado, and where does your eye go? To the cracks, which we call erosion, which suggests what about the forest that has been clear cut? If the soil is gone, what can't happen? Can't regrow. So two photographs from very different states at almost the exact same moment are snapped and become part of Pinchot's and his peers, um, well, lectures like this. They didn't have PowerPoint, but they went around the country flashing these lantern slides to show people what it was that was happening as a way to convey the urgency of the problem, the mismanagement that had occurred, and not so subtly to suggest what could have happened if you had somebody called, let's call him a forest ranger, who had regulations that would have slowed this process down and regulated the behavior of human beings who clear cut these forests. This is a shot almost simultaneously in Humboldt County, 
now fully marijuanaized, but back then all of that good timber had been cut down in a way that transformed this, this landscape. Um, and so a way to think about an existential crisis is to try to figure out what the political response can be. You can have all of the photographs you want, but what's the goal of the photograph? If you want to create a sense of urgency within an American population, there's got to be a hook. There has to be some kind of political action. You can't just leave it at, we're doomed. This is the nature of hope, right? You have to say that the system will, at some level, respond. And so the argument that that first generation of conservationists would make would, was that the political response could be actually a radical reorientation of American land policy that up until this point had one purpose and one purpose only. Take what we now call the public lands and give them away. Sell them for dirt cheap to whoever wants to homestead in western North Nebraska, God knows why, or wants a small plot of land in the Rockies, or wants to homestead anywhere that we have public lands that we're willing to sell, or you can steal. There wasn't a lot of controls over that behavior. Or you give it away to railroads, who will then turn around and sell it to people and bilk them like crazy, all in the name of capital development. An alternative is to not give away everything. And it doesn't now seem like a radical gesture, but I guarantee you we would never get this legislation through Congress today. The goal is to go after the lands that have not been given away and hold on to them. So what did they get? Between 1892, when the Angeles is created, um, and 1907. Look at the map and tell me what they went after. You know the West. You know what's there. Go back upstream, the mountains, right? They went after watersheds. Why? Why watersheds? Hmm? Because of water. Dick, you were right there, man. Um, because of water. And tell me about this part of the West and why there's a relationship between the apex of a watershed and why you want to defend that, protect that landscape. You won't have Seattle if you don't have the Wasatch covered in, in canopy. You're not the same as with the Sierra, the same as with even the Angeles. The fascinating thing is the enabling documents that were passed by Congress in 1891 and then 1897 that allowed presidents the right to set aside lands without going to Congress and they can just simply sign documents that say this is now a timberland reserve like the San Gabriel Mountains Timberland Reserve which was enacted in 1892. The first language is protect water resources. Not timber flows, flows of water. Because, I, and I put these cities in here, all of those cities today utterly depend on what that decision meant on the ground and in politics in the late 19th century. Every single one of them. Denver would not exist the ways that it does if the Rockies had been cut over like some of the Rockies had been done. The Sierra were deep into harvesting, and if that had gone, there would have been some serious problems downstream into the central uh, into the Central Valley, and the argument always was about the Angeles, the San Bernardino, the Cleveland, and the Los Padres, our four national forests in Southern California. They have no timber anybody wanted to cut, with some rare exceptions. It was always about water, that the protection of water was essential to life in Southern California. John Muir knew this as well. We tend to associate him with the Sierra, the place that he loved to hike, it turns out, were the San Gabriels because, as he says, it was the hardest hiking he ever did in his life. And anybody who has tried to scramble up, I don't name your spot, you go, yeah, Muir was not a fool. It's really hard work. But he also understood that that hard work was part of what made these mountains so exciting for those who lived here and for what Abbot Kinney man of famous boulevard in Venice Beach, a real estate developer, but the key to understanding the Angeles. 
because it's Abbott Kinney in the 1880s, before a lot of this conservation language had become well understood, who had been in France for many years, came back to the Southern California, looked at those mountains and said, my God, this is just like Southern France. It's the exact same ecosystem, it's the exact same, it's not exactly, but, but, but what he saw was that if you don't protect those slopes, places like Pasadena, where he had a home, would get wiped out by floods. So part of his argument was, as he says, the more roof-like these slopes become, the more flood-prone they are. So it's not just about protecting potable water, it's also protecting us from floods, which as we well know since 1938, uh, the big flood that took out Claremont, um, this is a serious problem. But keep in mind, this is in the 1880s when he's talking about this. And part of his act, it's sort of activism was to marshal support throughout the state going from one citrus farm to another, talking to one chamber of commerce after the other, trying to develop a coalition, a collaborative group that would understand why the Angeles needed to be protected um, and why these other mountain ranges needed to be protected as well. The second reason why Abbott Kinney's arguments ultimately would work and that LA as a region would have one of the earliest national forests, an urban forest, it was always an urban forest by this point, had to do with tourism. And um, Nina, Nina Dean uh, Halsey has written, wrote these really interesting travel logs. Uh, and one of her books is about a tenderfoot in Southern California. I wouldn't believe most of what she says because she understands tall tales and so likes to write them. Um, but she's really funny and she has this wonderful story about taking a mule up to, um, uh, up into the high ground of the Angeles. Um, but she's a reflection of a larger pattern in which every winter, hundreds of thousands of snowbirds, let's call them, flooded into Southern California, lured here in part because of orange groves and snow-capped mountains and beautiful sunny days, and it's not Chicago in December. And besides, you could get here for a buck on a railroad. And she knows who she's writing for. She isn't writing for Angelino, she's actually writing for these other tourists and describing this landscape not in the mirror language of a kind of an aesthetic enthrallment, but in fact as a place where you went to recreate, to recreate yourself. And that that was part of the lure, such by the late 19th century, well over 100,000 people a year are going up into the Angeles to do exactly what she did, which is to hike those trails, to recreate in the falls, to actually love this place, so much so that we had mechanic Me mechanized ways by getting up into these mountains and in Eaton Canyon and elsewhere, you could take streetcars that brought you right up into the canyon mouth and then you would get uh, other conveyances that would take you up, whether it's a mule um, or this wonderful confection. The other thing I love about this photograph to the right is the flat ground in the background. It's not just the steepness of the mountains and the flatness of that geography, it's the closeness of those two things. Those mountains have always been woven into uh, the urban fabric of this sprawling community that rolled along ro Wales, uh, even by the 19, early 1910s. That's a sprawled Los Angeles that depended upon streetcars, not automobiles. And so they become accessible and thus desirable, and Abbot Kinney is not alone in, in among his peers thinking, this place needs to be saved for lots of reasons, uh, and they managed to do so. That same kind of collaborative energy, that same notion that there's an existential crisis that we somehow need to solve, is recreated to a degree in 2014 when the San Gabriel Mountains um, National Monument would be enacted. And at the heart of this is not Obama's language, although it's really good, and the establishing language, uh, the designating language is really quite beautifully done. It's actually who's standing behind him. And this is a close-up. If I had panned out, it would be even more obvious. This is not your father's conservation group, and it's not an earlier generation's notion of who constitutes an environmental activist. This is actually what the San Gabriel Valley looks like in reality. 
the politics and the pressures are coming from working class, diverse audiences, uh, from, from Judy Chu, among others, who were there next to him. And that's what you do when the president is in town. I get that. But I want you to see who's there, because it's a very different set of coalitions than was true for Abbott Kinney, except for this. It is collaborative. It is a coalescing of people around a landscape that they equally love, as did Muir. They might use different language for it, but they will absolutely love that space. And it is in part that kind of coalition um, that is now required not to just create a national monument, but to create a national movement that's going to drive the conversation about climate change around these landscapes and others. What that movement broadly needs to be thinking about are the long-term pressures that these mountains and others are facing, starting with the climate itself. So this data takes us from 1980 to 2010. Actually, you could push it back to sort of the mid-'70s, a drying out process that is particularly punitive in the Southwest and West. It's been going on now not just since the mid-'70s, but it is still going on, despite the fact that we had a decent year's rain. Um, and this is the scenario um, for the end of, the, of, of this century. Swipe the one on the left out of the picture, because that's gone. The lower emission scenario we busted through eight years ago. We're now actually dealing with the higher emission scenario. Um, and this is how, as Pinchot did back in the day, you create urgency. This is not nothing. This is, in fact, going to be the lives of those of my students and others in this room and those, teak for you, um, uh, and for others who will replace them as well. And until 2016, this image was up on the website for EPA. It is now gone. Um, but the crosshatchings here is where their data was the most robust, which is everything from Los Angeles east to El Paso and north up into Nevada, a population of roughly 40 million people. What runs through that region? Colorado River, which supplies water for 40 million people. And if that's the end of this century, there's only one scenario, well, there's actually probably two, that's really going to play out here. And that is that the populations of places like Phoenix, Los Angeles, El Paso, Albuquerque, Tucson, and every other megacity that emerged since World War II in this very dry place that depended upon cheap water that came to them from the Colorado River will have to move because it's not sustainable. So where do they go? They fled the Rust Belt between the 50s and 80s, and that's where they're going to return. Why? Why Pittsburgh? Why Cleveland? Why Detroit? Why Chicago? Why Milwaukee? I'm naming all of the places that you should be seeing on a map and going, oh, yeah, they're right next to what? The Great Lakes. 20% of all fresh water supply on the planet. And you can start to see their population start to tick up already. So that's a bad prediction. I mean, that's like the urgency sort of plus 10. But I think that's actually what's going to happen, um, that that's, that's going to be one of the mechanisms by which this takes place. That isn't to say there is nothing we can do now. It is to say that that data isn't just numbers. It actually has social reality, lived experience that, that it is going to predict for us. Um, and those who can move will do so. Those who do not have the cushioning and the capacity to do so are going to be living in this landscape um, bereft of the waters that have once replenished this space. That's going to get complicated in another way. It isn't simply that the place is drying up is that we're shifting back and forth, as one uh, scientist describes it, as whiplash weather, that we're toggling back and forth between drought and deluge so fast that none of our systems are capable yet of cushioning 
those blows. If you remember um, the Thomas fire of the winter of 2017 in December, within three weeks, that punishing storm that dropped nine, 10 inches of rain almost immediately and as if it was radar targeted on those burn areas that created the flash floods in Montecito. That's what's gonna be going on for the rest of this century and beyond that point. This rapid oscillation that we don't yet have the structures to deal with. And that's complicated by another problem. I mentioned earlier that this region got whacked by floods in the 1930s and in the teens and in the 20s. The dams that ultimately went in in San Antonio Canyon, in Prado, in Whittier Narrows, uh, Sepulveda Dam and the like, were all built in the 40s and 50s in response to the 1938 flood. They are not in good shape right now. There was a piece in the LA Times which talked about Prado Dam. Prado Dam is actually in much better shape than Whittier Narrows on a scale of one to four, one not being good. Whittier Narrows is a one. And if you know where Whittier Narrows is, and then you look downstream from it, if that were to go, we're talking four million people are in the way of floods. Claremont's master plan looks at San Antonio Dam and predicts, probably not accurately, but I like the prediction, that were that dam to go with a subsequent flood, the waters would be in downtown Claremont within 20 minutes. Here's why I don't quite believe it. There's a lot of housing in between. There's like boulders, right? They're gonna divert the water in various ways. I mean, I wouldn't wanna be living up in those spaces, but, but you get the idea that I don't think it would come that fast, but so what if it's 30 minutes? That's still damn quick, right? So part of what we have to think about is not just these climatological issues, or but are the structures that we've embedded into the ground and how old they are and how unwilling we have been to invest in their reconstruction at some level. And it's not just this dam. Roosevelt Dam outside of Phoenix is problematic. Almost Dam, which is a flood retention dam just north of downtown San Antonio, um, was finally rehabbed in the 70s, but that was 30, 40 years ago, 50 years almost and it's not that good of a space. So part of it is that we've been borrowing against time. And part of an existential crisis is the time is actually shortening between the time in which you know there's a problem and when you act on that problem. Uh, okay, so this is getting even worse. So, so, so if you think about snow and the role that snow has played not just for the Colorado, but for the magnificently engineered system that is the State Water Project in, in California. The historic average over here on the left between 1960 and 1990 um, is predicted to be by the end of this century um, about 20% of what it once was. All of that ag in the Central Valley all of those homes that depend upon that water that is sluiced down through the Mojave and then turns and comes into this region. Um, the LA Aqueduct, which depends upon Eastern Sierra snowmelt. All of those systems are brittle. Not because they're not well built, they're great, beautifully built. They're brittle because you can't move them. They're depending upon systems that don't, natural systems, that may no longer be here. And it isn't that it's gonna stop raining it's that rain and snow are very different things. One stays put until it gets warm and then it can slowly trickle down the mountains, perfectly timed for ag. The other hits the ground and rolls. And whether we have the capacity to capture that rolling uh, from rain is another set of dilemmas that we have not yet fully resolved. Um, and for those of us who love images like this and what photographer doesn't, the San Gabriels by the end of this century are not predicted to have any snow whatsoever. Again, rain will fall, but snow will not. And that means not only the aesthetics will change, um, but we have to then worry again about that whiplashing process uh, and the dams that are lying in every single one of these canyons, and multiply so uh, in some cases. One other way to sort of make your, 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 you should have gone to the Ravelers, I'm telling you. Uh, I am just unraveling our processes here. Um, but is to think about the hydrological services that mountains supply. And the estimations, and this comes from, a, this piece just came out last year, um, that, that there are various ways to think this through, 
the guess is, and it's not a guess, it's probably um, much more accurate, is that the kind of water that we once provided off of these mountains is going to diminish radically by the end of this century. The same is true for the Rockies, the same is true for the Wasatch. Uh, more Northern Cascades, the expectation is actually they're going to get more water, so if you don't go to the Great Lakes, you might want to go north. Uh, Vancouver, looking really good right now. Uh, and beside, they have a, you know, they have a great song. The final piece is if we dry, we burn. It also is true that if we're wet, we burn, but let's hold on that. This is wildfire potential in Southern California. Is there a place that doesn't have potential? I mean, if you think about every single hill, and not just hills, by the way, this is a place that's born to burn. Add precipitation issues, and some of that's going to get more magnified. But this poses a dilemma for us for another set of reasons, because where are we building homes? but deep into these fire zones, structures that then become incendiary devices that then flush fire in multiple different directions. Um, this is not just about fire and a landscape, it's also where the human beings have chosen to live and why. And I get why one wants to sit on top of a, a, a ridge line. I mean, who wouldn't? It's absolutely gorgeous. In places that are fire prone, that may not be the wisest of choices. Uh, but it does pose a dilemma for us for what this means for this space. I think the dilemmas are probably a bit more pressing or seem to be more pressing than that which faced the generation of the post-Civil War era but they felt intense pressure to act as fast as they could. That pressure led them to advocate for not just political change, but institutional developments that would respond to the crisis. And again, the Forest Service, the Park Service, and other land management agencies are one expression of that. It's the same generation that gave us the Food and Drug Administration. It's the same generation that gave us clean air and clean water. The first initial legislation came from that progressive era. These people thought big, broad, and quickly all of which, as systems, are being under attack today. But that doesn't mean we can't think as broadly and as quickly as they did. And so one of the ways to start that process is to think about this place that we call ours, our home, and how we can better manage ourselves within it. And that requires, Dick, you said don't talk about energy efficiency, but I will talk about it because in part it is true that if we shift our reliance on fossil fuels towards more solar and other mechanisms that are not fossil driven, um, we have a chance to slow this process down. Maybe not enough to change the dynamics at the end of the century, but why would we wait to find out? If we think about water use, the argument has always been in California and the vast part of the West is go find somebody else's supply of water and take it. Whether it's Los Angeles or the State Water Project moving north to south, um, the irrigation companies that, that basically control much of the Sierra snowmelt that goes into the Central Valley, the damming up of rivers, all of these things are designed to control nature and then flow the water in different directions to serve our interests. But we already know there are other mechanisms by which to do this that are softer and cheaper and more efficient and ultimately more effective. Let me give you two examples. In Orange County has the best, most, the largest, the world's largest groundwater replenishment system anywhere. If Orange County can do it, one would think Los Angeles, with more people and hell of a lot more money, could be investing in this system. The catch, which is funny, a uh, little bit more expensive than, than they might have imagined, is that they are grabbing everything. Black water, gray water, I don't care what, call whatever the water is, they're grabbing it, they're replenishing it, they're dropping it back into their underground aquifers, and they're pumping it out the other end. Why? Because if you told people it's toilet to tap, they wouldn't drink it. But if you tell them it's groundwater, it might cost you a million bucks more a year to put it back in, and then you have to re-clean it once you put it back into the ground. It's still the best system in the world. 
Go to Singapore and you see what I think is actually what we should be doing because the buildings are organic. Nothing leaves the building. It is all churned and brought back in. The water is in a constant loop. I mean, it has to get treated for saline and, and, and stuff. But you can actually do it. I was there three years ago, visited a high school friend. He took me into the innards of the building. Very geeky fun. And I didn't know what I was looking at, but I was, I was a good student taking copious notes. Because every flush, every shower, every, every sink full of water stayed in that building, in that essentially island republic that does not want to depend on anybody else. I mean, it's a dream model. But you could do it. Such that you don't necessarily need external sources of water, and it's going to be too expensive anyway. You may have noticed that the governor uh, last Friday, Thursday, Friday, signed SB 307, a bill that shot, shut down a desert groundwater pumping scheme by a corporation called Cadiz Inc. that was going to solve Southern California's water supply. It was the best thing the governor has done because that's the last thing we should be doing is going after somebody else's water, sucking it in, and presuming that by so doing, we have, whew, thank God, we're safe. We're not safe. In a state of drought, which is this state, even when it rains, we're in a state of drought. What we should be doing is doing what we did in 2015 and 16, which is to shut the tap off and rejigger our imagination such that we don't require all of that. And it's not going to stop these mountains from burning. But it is a huge step. Conservation actually works, and that comes right out of the arguments of the late 19th century. Because they understood at the core that arid areas or semi-arid areas need to regulate their behavior if they're going to actually live in these landscapes. So part of this is about a challenge. That if you really love this space, and who doesn't? then we need to make our valley spaces as beautiful and as integral to the landscape as that. And if we take care of one, we will take care of the other. And I think that's the driving hope, at least it is for me, that to do this is to also change the way I think, the way I see, the way I feel. Um, and from that comes other kinds of operations and activism um, that I think will get us some of the way forward. Uh, I still think people will move because that will have to happen. But it, doesn't, but it also means that we are not, uh, what's the word for it, locked into, anchored into a kind of miserable state of victimhood. There's a lot we can do. There's a lot that we must do. And we just don't have a lot of time. Thanks very much. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'll come run around with the, the mic, and we'd just like to get you to speak. OK, a couple. I didn't catch the second uh, thing, uh, system that you were talking about in Orange County. You talked about groundwater reclamation. Yeah, replenishment. And replenishment. OK. So what about desalinization? I mean, I, I know it takes a ton of energy, yes, it does. and obviously you wouldn't want to use fossil fuels for that, yes. but there are other things coming online. Yeah, so desal is really interesting. It works in places where they don't have a lot of choice, and the cost of water is extremely high. And all of a sudden, in that context, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Australia, places like that, it makes a lot of sense. At the moment, because we have other systems that move water around this state at remarkable ways, um, for the city of Los Angeles to go move to the south, it's three times more expensive than it is to get water out of Owens River Valley, to get rid of water out of the state water project. And until that gap narrows, it's not going to work here. And it's the other reason why I wouldn't push it here is that we have alluvial soils. Put it in the ground. It's the cheapest place ever because you don't build reservoirs. You don't have to build dams. It's right here. 
Um, the lower part of the LA River, for example, is much more clay-like soils, and you're going to have a harder time doing what San Fernando, the San Gabriel, the Pomona Valley, and, and, and the like can do, because we have a certain soil system. San Diego has gone, or is starting to move towards deep south. They don't have the same geology, and that's part of the driver for them. Um, but still, that plant in, I'm blanking on the name of the town, um, is really expensive. Carlsbad? Yeah, Carlsbad, thank you. Yeah. So I think for, for market reasons, it's a ways out. I mean, it's obviously a proven technology. It's really um, energy consuming. Um, and it also is problematic environmentally because of what then happens with the salts and other discharges um, that tend to get poured into the ocean. Yes, please. Is there any kind of self-sustaining um, uh, model for a home? Like what you talked about in Singapore, are there people thinking about trying to create something like that? Yeah, for yeah. and you can actually do it now with gray water recycling. Um, <laughs> you can take your laundry machine, your water, and, and, and sort of take that and put that out into gardens and other kinds of things so that you're not using fresh water that's come from Sierra snowmelt or northern Rocky snowmelt. I mean, it is sort of a waste. But is the cost prohibited? No, no, it's actually fairly cheap. Um, yeah, there was actually a dialogue some years ago. Did, they, did we not do it with the Great Water Corps, or whatever their names are, that came here? Um, it's not that expensive. And so you can do it, for example, with the landscaping. That's what you would use this water for. Um, and, you know, in time it can perk down into the groundwater itself. So that that's a that's a win-win. Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Why do you think there isn't a greater push to uh, retain rainwater when it when we do get it, either either as you're saying in the aquifers or in reservoirs or wherever we can hold it, why isn't that a bigger topic in the state, and why aren't more of our elected officials talking about that and and actually doing something about it? I mean, I mean, we have the spreading grounds up here, you know, so we're sort of doing a little bit of our own part, but it, it seems that there's a a lot of opportunities that we aren't utilizing. Yeah, there are a lot of opportunities we aren't utilizing, and I think part of it is that, um, so, you know, we're having a lot of conversation about various technologies and ways of doing that. Um, some of the dilemmas, and let me use San Fernando, Va San Fernando Valley as an, uh, um, as an option, or as a sort of conversation piece, it has an extraordinary aquifer, absolutely extraordinary. Trillions of gallons could be stored there. The dilemma is, Cold War, jet fuels, and other kinds of things have poured into there for decades. And you, to pull water out of there, you have to reverse osmosis and do all sorts of things to clean it. Uh, you can never clean the aquifer. It's gone as a, as a clean entity. So we've wasted an incredible opportunity, although the San Gabriel Valley has figured out a way to do it relatively cheaply. Um, the other thing, and, and sort of LA is now thinking about this, and that's the thing that drives me nuts, shut up with the thinking and get to acting because we actually know how to, you don't have to get it at the spreading fields, although at the San, uh, Santa Fe Dam, you know on the 210, if you look at, that's a huge, huge spreading ground. Well, what happens if the rain falls this side of the dam, right, and starts flowing downstream? You can capture it at the end, you can put it into the coastal aquifers, which will do one thing really quickly. It will create the static energy that will hold the, the salt water out of there because that stuff is starting to intrude. And once that happens, it's game over. So there are things that they are talking about doing but aren't. Um, and it, frankly, it drives me nuts because they've known about this for decades. The USGS, the US Geological Sur Service, has been telling this region, these are the things you can do. And they are not that hard and they are not that expensive. The dilemma is we can always get somebody else's water. And that's the, that's the sort of um, equation that has to be broken. Because essentially, the water that lands here, we don't care about, which goes right to your question. We don't, and we flush it out through flood control channels, which are tremendously efficient. If you go back and you look at the original designs for those things, sometimes the engineers would say, what we really want to have happen is have that drop of water enter this system and get to the ocean in 60 minutes. You can't drive that fast. Well, that is an incredible system. It's also stupid. Because if we held that water in other ways, 
we don't need the state water project at quite the level that we need it. So, um, I'm, you know, I think there are fixes that could be done and, it, and um, you know, Sacramento or LA or wherever the power brokers are that do this stuff have not yet um, done what's needed. And I think that's partly because the urgency isn't thought to be actually urgent as long as there's snow up in the mountains. But by the time we recognize there is no snow and thus no snow melt and thus no state water project is way too late. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Cadiz project. Yes, yes. Um, I was I, with a group of uh, four-wheel drive, uh, a group, four-wheel drive group uh, connected with the Barstow Museum. Uh -huh. And uh, we went to the Cadiz project. And uh, they, they showed us their vineyards and had drip systems. And they had a big pool and it was water was shooting out. And I understood that what they were saying was that um, this, they were advocating the use of uh, groundwater storage or storage of water in the ground rather than building dams. Right. But uh, could you sure. elucidate that? I mean, if I, had, if I owned that much groundwater, I'd say the same thing. Um, it would not stop. I mean, everything is dammed in California. There's not going to be new dams built anyway because there's no place to put them. You might raise some of them taller, but at some point, that's probably not technologically a smart move. Um, the question that one has about that particular project uh, is not whether it replaced or could replace dams. It's whether we should be pumping groundwater um, 100 and something miles away from Los Angeles and through energy means move it east or west, excuse me, uh, into this area. Because that's a, um, it's like a mirage, literally a mirage, that this is going to solve our water problems for X number of years. Um, I'd rather us t face more hard truths, which is we have a problem. That's not the fix. Um, it's what we've always done since 1910, is to go after other people's water. Why don't we break that model for a second, step away from it, and come up with a better way by which to live here now um, under not straightened circumstances, because there's lots of ways to reutilize water such that, in fact, our economic vitality does not diminish as a consequence of, of, of sort of um, low flow toilets and low flow um, technologies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for Please. your presentation. Yeah. So, in regards to getting the youth on board, yes. um, I think. I work for an alliance of different youth from the inner city and reservations. It's called the Abundance Alliance. And the idea of this is that um, we can increase our quality of life by addressing some of the issues that you're presenting. So for example, um, we're working with a pilot project in Boulder. Boulder has a bunch of right. undeveloped space. It'll never be developed, but it's been really eroded with cattle. So the hope is that um, you, know, you can restore that land, you can increase the moisture content of the soil so Good. the area will do better with climate change. But my question is, based on your research, um, where do you see the greatest opportunities for increasing our quality of life and addressing this crisis? Well, I think what you just said is where I would start. That historically we have thought about the environment as a place out there and people are here and we have treated the two as separate spaces. Um, that one's natural, beautiful, this one who gives a shit, let's just deal with it what it is. Um, and part of what you've just said is to figure out ways to do two things simultaneously, which is to love places like that and to love people, um, regardless of where they live and what their situations are, um, that the health of the environment and the health of the body politic are actually conjoined. They are not different things. Um, and so if we think about environmental justice, advocacy, and activism, um, it is predicated on the notion that injustice for landscapes, like injustice for human beings, um, degrades both. And that we have to solve these kinds of things that, that you're describing. And I would say, for me, that's um, philosophically where you start. And then it depends on the place. And I think that's part of what I'm, I should make explicit, that what's true for this part of Southern California may not well be true for other parts of the state. I mean, because they're all different ecosystems. And every single ecosystem requires a different kind of response. But at the base, you approach it the same way. 
What's healthy for the land is healthy for the people. And if that's the way you think it through, then those health markers will be different, but you're looking for them to help you get there. So Boulder, Colorado, you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> On the, on the eastern slope of the Rockies is not here and here is not there, and so we'll figure out different ways of, of working with different sets of coalitions of people. But it has to start somewhere ethically. That's got to be the foundation. Um, and I think that's what you've put your finger on. Yeah, and the big mission is well, and I think, that's, I think that's at the heart of, of the argument, right? Other people lived here for thousands of years and didn't run into these problems. The numbers were different, to be sure. But again, the ethic by which one does live here matters. There's this wonderful Spanish painting from the 1740s, 1750s of Santa Barbara of a Chumash village down by the coast. And in the backdrop, the hills are on fire. And I use that in my classes to say, what's going on here? What do they know that we don't? And I'm not looking at you, Paul, but I am. Why, why live in the place that the Shumash knew and the Tongva people knew burned? Like, you can go up there for the resources, but why would you live there, right? It becomes a moral question that is ancient on the one hand and absolutely contemporary on the other. And I think that's part of it also, right, is, is sort of thinking through how those systems once functioned um, and, and why they functioned in the ways they did and that the human settlement patterns actually, if you go back to those ancient contemporary systems, uh, we might live a very different life and we might live a healthier one in the process. Thank you. I, I have a question. Yes, Freeman. Uh, what role do you think Claremont ought to play in making this happen? Seems like we have exceptional resources here. We do. And do you have thoughts of how to move forward in that direction? Well, you know, a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on in this system of trees, PhDs, and retirees. Um, and, and I think part of what has been so exciting to live here again uh, for the last 12 years um, is to see the energy that flows in the community, into the campus, from the campus out into the community. Um, but it's also striking to me how slow that process is. Um, and, and the degree to which we need to expedite many of these kinds of changes. And so whether, and you and I were talking about it at this beginning, so I'll do that pitch. Um, if you're going to recreate South Claremont in some fashion, um, why not start ethically again with what's the energy flows, what are the water flows, what's the waste stream, and build those new things into the system before you grant them a construction permit. You only have a narrow period of time when you have leverage with a developer and you crank that leverage as hard as you can before you say yes. And for me, if we don't solve waste stream issues, water flows, and energy flows, there's no point. Because that's just standard development. Let's build stuff because we can build stuff. Um, growth as the default is problematic at best. Um, but if you, don't put, if you don't put a pressure on those to build in ways that are way more resilient than what we've done in the past, it's, it's a problem. Nancy. Thank you. I probably want to build on what Freeman was asking. The new construction along Foothill, my understanding was it was going to have bioswales. Yes. And I know Pomona College has its own bioswale. Could you just give us like a real, sh like, bioswales for dummies pitch so we understand <laughs> if that's something we can do in our own homes? Yeah, or if it is. So imagine this. It's raining in January, if it is, please. That water hits your roof. What then happens? Right. So in Colorado, you can't do this because the, air, the water in the air is God's. The moment it hits a surface, it's owned by somebody else and it isn't you. So you can't capture it on sight in Colorado. Partly because LA owns a lot of that water, depending on what slope we're on, right? Here, you can capture it. You can capture it through a bioswale, which is a depression in in, in the landscape um, that, you, that will then, depending on the soils beneath it, allow that water to percolate down underground. Pomona has one wrapped around its first street garage. It's an absolutely stunning system. 
we don't know whether it works or not, but it's a stunning system. Uh, because every time I have a student project, it never rains, so we can't do any of the analysis. It's driving us crazy. Uh, but it's gorgeous and it's work. The ones that actually work are the most banal things possible, which is if you're standing in front of little bridges, to the left is this big depression, and you think, God, can't they spend some money to just level this thing out? Well, it's actually a bioswale that captures all the water coming off of Marston Quad, and within 30 minutes, that stuff is gone. It's absolutely gorgeous. Pitzer College has them around Gold Gym and, and the new dorms. Um, there are ways in which we're punching holes into the concrete, and that's absolutely essential because the concrete's the problem. So there's an old system that the Spanish understood well is that you capture water because summer is coming. They grew up in Mediterranean ecosystems. They understood that. Uh, what we need to do is more of that. And in LA, there are codes now that require you to keep water on site. The new dorms at Pomona capture all water that flow across them, drop it under 6th Street, bring it out to the Greek Theater, um, which is an old sinkhole, and just let it sit there and work its way down into the old wash that's been, you know, grass on top of it, but it's a wash, and, and then it goes back into the system. If you cross, actually, Scott, I will shout out to the Chino Basin Water Conservation District, um, which if you have not been, you need to go because the building is stunning, and Scott gives an extraordinary tour, uh, which he gave to one of our classes uh, this spring. But that building is organic in the way in which it captures water and then demonstrates multiple ways by which pavement and pavers and diversions can hold water on site and let it just sink back in. And the organization itself has done that by owning quarries, old quarries, that now serve in vast ways to capture water. And I did notice that they are replenishing. And it has not rained in a while, Scott. So clearly, this is state water project coming down and going into those sites, uh, which is a system that works. So we're getting old new snow melt that works its way down into this area and then is percolated into the Chino Basin. It's not bad. So there are lots of tools that we have at our hands. Uh, the question is whether we're thinking about those uplands and their relationship to us. The final thing I would say is that same Forest Service that was created to protect the Angeles and the, and the Wasatch and the Cascades and the Sierra have been working on a project since the early 2000s called Forest to Tap, Forest to Faucet, to remind people of the direct connection between there and here. That if you look at Baldy, you're looking at the apex of our watershed, and that's where our water used to come from, and a good chunk of it still does. And if you start to think about that relationship between that forest and your faucet, you begin to think about your faucet in different ways. And I think that's a really healthy, very hopeful way to approach the coming century. So thanks very much.